This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. In Destroyer 2 and Ukraine's power grid, more on last week's distributed denial of service attack against Finland, Anonymous claims to have doxed Russia's Ministry of Culture, Hafnium gets evasive, Enemy Bot is under development but worth keeping an eye on, Changing the Fish Hook, Patch Tuesday Notes, Tim Eads from Cyber Mentor Fund on digital and security transformations. Our guest is Aaron Schiltz from NetSpy on proactive public-private sector security collaboration. And sanctions evasion is serious business. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, April 13th, 2022. We begin with a note on disinformation. Russia's recent we meant to do that emphasis on the Donbass is intended to tell everyone that the special military operation is all going according to plan. In fact, it represents a significant departure from Moscow's pre-war planning, which appears to have anticipated the quick decapitation of the government in Kiev. The change in plans was motivated by the invasion's failure in the northern part of Ukraine. The UK's Ministry of Defense yesterday offered a terse rebuttal of President Putin's claim that his war against Ukraine was going according to plan. Quote, The Kremlin says its war in Ukraine is going to plan, but it's not. Russia's plan is failing. As evidence, the MOD cites the loss of at least six Russian generals killed in action, instances of Russian troops turning on their commanding officers, and 2,151 vehicles, artillery pieces, or aircraft damaged, abandoned, destroyed, or captured. That is more than three times the rate of comparable Ukrainian losses. The forced retreat of Russian forces into Russia and Belarus, and Russian aircraft lost to friendly fire. All armies face friction in real war, but Russia's record seems to go far beyond the normal difficulties, and it hardly seems that much at all has gone according to plan. The GRU's attempt against the Ukrainian power grid appears to be the cyber attack most people were expecting back in February, especially because of the way it tracked earlier GRU takedowns of sections of Ukraine's power grid. It also appears to have failed, and that failure may be attributed in part to successful Ukrainian defenses as well as to the methods Russia chose to use. In cyberspace as well as on the ground, Ukraine appears to have proved a tougher opponent than Russia expected. In the December 2015 attacks, the GRU's Sandworm unit pivoted into the grid via spear phishing emails that carried black energy malware as their payload. The outages, then induced, lasted up to six hours. The 2016 attack against Ukraine's grid used in-destroyer malware, also called Crash Override, an updated version of which was used in this month's attempt. ESET, which provided some of the initial response to the attacks, did not speculate on how the GRU gained access to the systems it hit, but the record cited CERT-UA as saying that the attackers moved laterally between different network segments by creating chains of SSH tunnels. While the overall effect of the recent attempt on the grid may have been negligible, reports obtained by MIT Technology Review indicate that the attack did succeed in taking some electrical substations offline. 
Security Scorecard has published a study of the distributed denial-of-service attack against Finnish government sites last Friday. The incident coincided with an address to Finland's government by Ukrainian President Zelensky and during a period of speculation that Finland is preparing to apply for EU and NATO membership. The researchers attribute the DDoS attack to the Zadnost botnet, which they had observed in attacks against Ukraine in late February and early March. Zadnost is greed in Russian. Security Scorecard says they've identified some 350 bots, most of them located in Bangladesh and a range of African countries. The report says the majority of the bots are microtick routers running various microtick services or devices running Squid Proxy and vulnerable Apache web servers. Attribution is, as usual, difficult and heavily circumstantial, but Security Scorecard assesses with moderate confidence that Russian units or some threat actor aligned with Russian interests were responsible for the attack. The consequences of the attack were temporary and not particularly damaging, but the researchers add that subsequent attacks might be more consequential. If one were to bet on form, one would expect the next move from the Russian cyber threat actor playbook to include deployment of wiper malware. The hacktivist collective Anonymous has released 446 gigabytes of data to the DDoS Secrets dump site, emails for the most part. They all seem to be targets of opportunity, doxed because they were doxable and not with any immediate operational results in mind. The Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center has published an update to earlier research by both Microsoft and Palo Alto Networks describing the Chinese threat actor Hafnium, The malware it's been observed using recently, Tarask, evades detection by using hidden scheduling tasks whose attributes it subsequently removes. This has succeeded in concealing it from many common forms of detection and identification. Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs describes a botnet used by the Keksek Group, a criminal gang specializing in distributed denial-of-service and crypto-jacking. The researchers call the botnet EnemyBot, and while it appears to still be under development, it incorporates elements of older botnets. ZDNet describes EnemyBot as a Mirai GAFGIT hybrid. Prompted by recent Microsoft security moves against malware delivered by VBA Office macros, QBot's operators are changing tactics. Instead of using malicious Microsoft Office documents as the hook in phishing emails, They're switching to delivering malicious MSI Windows installer packages by password-protected zip files, bleeping computer reports. Yesterday was Patch Tuesday. Microsoft released over 100 fixes, including two that address zero days. One of the zero days, CVE 2022-24-521, permits privilege escalation exploitation of the Windows Common Log File System Driver, and Microsoft credits NSA with tipping them off to the issue. Citrix published four advisories and Apache upgraded struts. On Monday, Google issued an update for Chrome. And CISA issued five industrial control system advisories yesterday. And finally, there's nothing inherently nefarious about cryptocurrencies or newfangled digital commodities, but they do have a certain attraction for sanctions evaders. And unfortunately for some experts in the relevant fields, helping governments under sanction evade sanctions is something the authorities are taking seriously. Virgil Griffith, formerly a researcher with the Ethereum Foundation, took a guilty plea last September to charges of conspiring to violate the International Emergency Economic Powers Act by traveling to North Korea to deliver a presentation on blockchain technology. Reuters reports that a U.S. federal court yesterday imposed a sentence of five years and three months, plus a $100,000 fine on Mr. Griffith. While stiff, the sentence was less than prosecutors had requested. Griffith's attorney, Brian Klein, said in a statement that while the sentence was disappointing, the judge acknowledged Virgil's commitment to moving forward with his life productively and that he is a talented person who has a lot to contribute.
And now, a word from our sponsor, Axonius. As IT and security pros, we can all agree on two things. Complexity is increasing, and traditional asset inventory approaches no longer cut it. The only path forward? Challenging what we think we know. That means saying goodbye to the old way of doing things and saying hello to Axonius. The Axonius Cybersecurity Asset Management Platform correlates asset data from existing solutions to provide an always up-to-date inventory, uncovers gaps, and automates action. Axonius gives IT and security teams the confidence to control complexity by mitigating threats, navigating risk, decreasing incidents, and informing business-level strategy, all while eliminating manual, repetitive tasks. Visit axonius.com slash cyberwire-complexity to learn more and try it free. That's A-X-O-N-I-U-S dot com slash cyberwire-complexity. An interesting aspect of the way cybersecurity has developed is that neither the public nor private sectors have any sort of monopoly on keeping the wheels of civilization turning. Aaron Schiltz is president and CEO of NetSpy, and we reached out to him for a discussion on why proactive public-private sector security collaboration is key to securing both corporate and government networks. Here's Aaron Schiltz. We're fortunate in cybersecurity, unlike other tech sectors. In cyber, you know, we all defend against a common adversary. So I think there's, you know, some benefit by default. You know, we see a ton of uh, just peer-to-peer kind of grassroots collaboration among industries. Certainly something I've seen, you know, in local cyber groups. Um, We see it in the ISACs. I mean, they're a great example of of member-driven organizations where there's just, just a lot of sharing that goes on. Um, in in some cases, maybe more industry collaboration than it is uh, public-private partnerships where, candidly, I think there's actually some opportunities to improve there. It seems to me like certainly uh, as of late, we've seen uh, more of a desire and an intentionality from the public sector organizations to partner with private sector organizations. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, even if you think about some of the legislation, this is maybe a little less partnership, but just, you know, the simple basis with the Strengthening American Cyber Act from from February of this year, just requiring organizations to report attacks within 72 hours. Of course, this, you know, more applies more to critical infrastructure and, and, and the Fed. But in a world where, you know, an organization facing reputational damage from a breach, you know, may not be quick to report it, you know, notwithstanding state and and federal regulations. So simple things like that, um, you know, requiring that ransomware payments are are, uh, reported and that just the overall industry can do better at understanding what's happening at the macro level, I think can be very, very helpful. Do you understand some of the resistance that folks have with some of these reporting requirements? Do do their arguments make sense at all? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, again, every... Every organization is a little bit different. Some of the recording reporting requirements vary significantly from state to state, from country to country. So think about for a large multinational enterprise, it's very complex just to figure out, um, you know, how to respond from a regulatory perspective, just what you're required to do, um, even if you uh, have the best intentions and are trying to do the right thing. So that's kind of step one is just figuring out how to respond. And then, of course, you know, again, there's um, um, a lot of dollars at stake. There's reputational damage. There's the loss of customer data. And um, are, are, are you reporting an incident at the federal level before you've even had an opportunity to report to your customers? There's just a lot of complexities there that I think well-intentioned organizations need to work through. And so if there's pushback, I think that's probably some of it. You know, interestingly, one of the one of the ways that that we see uh, public private collaboration, unfortunately, is federal law enforcement agencies sometimes being the first ones to notify an organization that they've been breached. So, you know, said another way, the organization doesn't have the controls and the systems to understand that a breach has occurred, and they're finding out through federal law enforcement. Um, and, and that's actually fairly common, especially in you know smaller and less mature organizations. What are your recommendations for folks in the private sector in terms of engaging with some of those public sector organizations? 
you know, it's just important to be involved in in a world where, you know, one of our biggest challenges is just finding the talent, finding qualified cybersecurity talent to run our programs and run our organizations. Um, there's a lot of people moving fast and just trying to get through each day. So sometimes it's a matter of just kind of like taking a deep breath, thinking strategically and ensuring that part of your security program is to work with those public sector organizations. It could be as simple as uh, monthly InfraGuard meetings where you're you know, attending and listening and building relationships with, with InfraGuard and some of these other organizations. Um, there's a lot of collaboration that takes place, again, even in the ISACs. And sometimes it's less about um, you know, specific targeted threat information that's actionable. And it's more about hey, I'm a you know financial services organization. I have a certain problem and you kind of put it out to the group and it's amazing the collaboration that takes place. I see this in the ISACs often where it's, you know, these are competitors working closely together to defend against a common adversary. And so I, I think some of it's just, again, kind of that blocking and tackling and being purposeful about taking the time uh, to build the relationships. That's Aaron Schiltz from NetSpy. And now a word from our sponsor, Invicti. Your organization is building and updating business-critical web applications faster than ever. And with so much pressure to move fast, you may find yourself making trade-offs between innovation and security. Now you can build fast without sacrificing security, thanks to Invicti. Invicti is the application security platform that helps your dev, sec, and ops teams work together to secure every website, web app, and API even if you have thousands. With unparalleled accuracy and automation, Invicti scales like no other AppSec solution. And with more than 50 integrations, Invicti slides into your workflows more smoothly than any other platform. Now you can innovate as fast as you want without compromising on security. Discover why many of the world's largest organizations innovate securely with Invicti. Visit i.invicti.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Invicti for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Tim Eads. He is the CEO at V Armor and co-founder of the Cyber Mentor Fund. Uh, Tim, always great to welcome you back to the show. Uh, I want to touch today on some of the transformations when it comes to digital technology and security that I know you and your colleagues are tracking. What can you share with us today? Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. I, I love the show. So when we look at over the last few years, digital transformation has really accelerated with the pandemic. You know, whether it's you're Levi's or whether you're a large bank, everybody has been accelerating to the cloud, but that transforms your attack service. And that leaves you open, your attack service, whether it's you know, across your infrastructure from your data center to your mainframe all the way through to your public cloud, has been stretched. And so that's causing resiliency issues. So then you put this wave on it from like um, from ransomware, and obviously Colonial Pipeline was the big one last year that made everybody in the country wake up. When you look at ransomware, it's, a, it's an attack where people are obviously holding assets in order to get money back, but they're crippling the infrastructure in order to, to get the leverage. So that, that's, a, that's the first time where you've really seen over the last, I don't know, 20 years where cybersecurity has now become a resiliency play, right? Because once things are getting compromised on a ransomware attack, you know, they are compromising the ability for the business to function, and so the cybersecurity function in the past obviously has its a, a whole breadth of skills. But what I'm what I'm seeing now is this rise over the last two or three years of resiliency as a conversation and resiliency as a responsibility of the CISO, not just as they secure against the ransomware attacks, they are making it and they are ensuring that that the business is more uh, resilient. Now, difficult in a pandemic. Very difficult as you accelerate digital transformation because people will put, you know, business um, priorities sometimes ahead of security, but security has to be an enabler to digital transformation, not a restrictor. When we're talking about resiliency, can, can you give us some insights as to, I mean, what is the spectrum of, of areas that that covers? Because I suspect it touches a lot of different places in a business. 
Let me give an example. There's a great bank that I know couldn't process 100,000 plus credit cards in one morning because the, the payment system was down. The payment system in that particular case was dependent on multiple applications serving it. As one of those applications serving the payment gateway was actually compromised, you know, the whole payment system collapsed and could, couldn't process these credit cards. So that's an example where the payment gateway, uh, the payment solution has multi hop dependencies uh, on it. And if you have one outage, the whole thing is affected. And the challenge becomes, as you move certain apps to the cloud, and not all of them go there, right, into the hybrid cloud world, which everybody's adopting, applications took horizontally, not vertically, as in across the environment. So they will go horizontally. And so your multi hop dependency is across the environments as well as anything else. So it's difficult. You have to embrace, obviously, digital transformation to compete and to survive. But at the same time, you know, resiliency is becoming a critical function for the CISO to keep his head on. The organizations that, that you see doing this well, are, are there any common threads there? That's a great question. So the level of uh, resiliency understanding really does vary. I mean, what we find is companies and large retailers, a friend of mine was security, one of the largest retailers in the States, really struggle to understand the terrain of their application, the terrain of their, you know, of their environments that's been served up. So the lack of visibility, the lack of understanding is really hard to get because they will see all these workloads, but they don't understand what they are. Because a lot of the, the data within the organization is mislabeled or not labeled at all. And so they might see all these applications, all these flows, but they don't know what they are. So I think that's what's causing the challenges. All right, well, interesting stuff for sure. Tim Eads, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making this CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, PlexTrack. PlexTrack, the proactive cybersecurity management platform, boosting teams' efficiency and effectiveness. Learn more at plextrack.com slash the cyberwire. And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Balecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Traceroute. The digital world is fascinating with pivotal events, people, and societal changes that led to how the internet was designed. And there's a great new podcast that covers this journey, the Traceroute Podcast, a seven-part series about the inner workings of our digital world. Traceroute is an inside look into the people and events that shape the way it's built, like how the launch of Sputnik led to the modern internet. Traceroute dives into the physical infrastructure that makes up the internet and where it could go, with interviews and stories from some of the leading technologists, entrepreneurs, and innovators of the past 40 years who are in the trenches, trying to solve complex hardware and software problems that no one had ever faced before. Listen and subscribe to the Traceroute podcast on your favorite podcast platform or go to origins.dev and learn more. That's the Traceroute Podcast. And we thank Traceroute for sponsoring our show.